you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you guys being here today. Uh, be sure to watch the video version of this on youtube.com for slash Chris Voss. You can see our wonderful guest in full Technicolor. They have this Technicolor that's out nowadays. It's not like the old black and white. It's got color, and uh, you can actually see it. Uh, and all that good stuff. So uh, be sure to watch for that. Uh, this is a returning guest we've had on the show. I'll keep you in suspense through the bio. Uh, and you can also go to our newest syndicator. We have a billion of them. You can find us everywhere. But uh, Amazon Music. You can go on Amazon Music, and there's a podcast section now. Search for The Chris Voss Show or any of the nine podcasts, and you can listen over there. You know, if that's your thing, if you're an Amazon on music person now you don't have to go someplace else to hear the show uh also follow us on goodreads.com you can find me under chris voss just search under there where the chris voss show is uh, putting up a book club that we have over there it has all our reviews uh different things and topics etc cetera, etc cetera. some of our references of course to the interviews we're doing here so be sure to check that out goodreads.com uh today is a returning guest who's one of our most popular guests we had on the show uh he came here promoting his future book that we'll talk about many of you may know him especially if you've been on a diet or read some diet books he's very popular in that field his name is dr jason fung md he's a canadian nephrologist nephrologist i think i got that right he's a leading expert on intermittent fasting and low carb especially for treating with people with type 2 diabetes he's written three best-selling health books and he co-founded the intensive dietary management program. He has his own websites at idm.health and thefastingmethod.com. He graduated from the University of Toronto, completed his residency at the University of California, Los Angeles. He lives and works in Toronto, Canada. And uh, welcome to the show. How are you, Dr. Fung? Very good. Thanks for having me back, Chris. Thanks for coming back. You know, you uh, uh, l- let's plug your books first before we get into it. Give us your plugs on where people can look you up on the interwebs. Yeah, so that was my first book called The Obesity Code and really talking about sort of how to understand uh, what causes weight loss and weight gain because the way that we think about uh, how to lose weight pretty much is all wrong. That is this, we have this idea that you're really supposed to just focus on calories in, calories out, just eat 500 fewer calories a day and you're going to lose weight for sure. The truth is that everybody's done it and it doesn't work pretty much for anybody. And there's a good reason for that. And it's all based on the science of how the body sort of uh, gains and loses weight. And that's what really the, the, the obesity code was talking about. And then at the end of that book, I start talking about intermittent fasting and fasting, which is uh, a sort of ancient strategy used by people um, and how that might uh, play into uh, you know another way that people can try to lose weight that's going to be hopefully more successful for them. But the point is that there's lots of different ways to lose weight. So the more things that the more options you have, the better off you are because you can use it or you can not use it. And that's what the complete guide to fasting is about, which is a sort of a much more practical guide to sort of thinking about fasting and uh, you know, what, what the ins and outs are, what the problems are, what the possible solutions are and the different regimens and all that kind of stuff. So it's a much more practical guide uh, about how to do the fasting. And then, you know, those books came out in 2016. So, and I had started using it and writing about it probably in 2013. So, you know, back then, of course, it was really just people thought, the whole idea of fasting was a terrible, terrible idea. And luckily in, the, in, in those years, since it's come out, it's become much, much more popular. You can see it, you know, all over the place. People are talking about it in the websites and the news and they're doing studies on it. Um, but it's sort of, you know, um, hopefully going to provide people a way to successfully manage their weight and by losing weight then they're going to improve their health because that's going to put you at much lower risk of a lot of 
the metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, which may lead to other diseases like heart disease, you know, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, blindness, kidney disease, that kind of thing. So it does play, of course, a very important role in addition to weight, you know, uh, causes joint problems and knee problems and back pain and all this sort of stuff. So there's a lot of reasons other than just looking good uh, to try to lose weight. And this is just, you know, an attempt to get people to understand the, 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 the process of weight loss and also to give them some practical guides to how to do it. Nice. Then let's give a plug to, uh, well, Let's give a plug to your forthcoming book that people should uh, go ahead and pre-order. This is uh, The Cancer Code, a revolutionary new understanding of medical mystery, The Wellness Code. That's going to be out November 20th. Uh, I'm sorry, November 10th, 2020. (laughs) <laughs> uh, so you can pre-order that baby. And if you Google on the Chris Voss show uh, or some of our other shows, uh, uh, Dr. Fung, you should be able to come up with our prior, prior show that we took and did on the Cancer Code book. And we spent a good hour talking about this. And it was very enlightening, very awakening, uh, made a lot of logical sense to me, especially with my experience with um, taking care of cancer patients and, uh, and also uh, me losing a lot of weight. I should mention too, that the obesity code, even though it came out in 2016, still is the number one bestseller in endocrinology and metabolism. So congratulations there. You're just running up the, running up the ratings there. So uh, you've got two books here that you sent me, the Obesity Code, Unlocking the Secrets of Weight Loss, and the Complete Guide to Fasting. This one I like because it's got a lot of pictures in it. I, I went to public school, so I like pictures. <laughs> uh, so what should we, should, should we dig into first? I think this one's kind of an expansion or like a graph, graphic version of this one, or how does that work? Well, they're different. One is the Obesity Code is more of a science book. It's really just talking about the how sort of uh, the body gains and loses weight. Um, and the, the Complete Guide to Fasting is to taking that idea and understanding and then really expanding it into the practical aspects of fasting and how to apply it, what to expect and what the, uh, you know, how to deal with it and what the different ways that you can do it are and that, that kind of thing, sort of tips, tricks, that kind of thing. So both are, they're, they're, they're complementary. They don't go for the same thing, but they're sort of, um, they sort of go hand in hand in that one is very much more understanding and one is much more sort of practical. So some people like to just jump in and say, tell me what to do. I don't really care about it, but the, about why it works and so on and just tell me what to do and that's the complete guide to fasting the other one is like for people who really want to understand well why is it that all these americans have gained so much weight like to me it's a real um it's a real mystery uh that is not well sort of explained because the problem is that if you look at 1970 uh, versus 2020, so 50 years ago, they're, the, the Americans are not, they're not obese, right? You can look at any sort of, you know, statistic. And if you look back at old pictures from the 60s and 70s, you can see almost everybody was fairly slender. But nobody's watching their diet. And people say, well, you know, there's more TV or whatever. But if you look at it, people are the same. Like, uh, you know, if you had an office worker in the 1960s, he's spending all day in the office. <laughs> it's no different than, the, you know, us spending all day in the office in 2020, right? It's the same thing. People played sports. They played soccer. They like to go to baseball games and watch basketball and whatever it is, right? They did the same things that we do today. They didn't they didn't eat uh, quinoa. They was eating white bread and jam and Oreo cookies and stuff. So why is it that it was so much easier? And nobody did a lot of exercise. There was no LA fitness. There was nothing like that, right? Jogging was one of these things that only crazy people did, right? <laughs> so it, it, it was... <laughs> You couldn't so, drink water in the 70s because, you know, it was brown. <laughs> Shit, we had water catching on fire in America in the yeah, 70s. Right. We, had, we had rivers just lighting up in fire. So it, it's, a, it's a real mystery to me that people don't 
you know, never really thought about what it is that's different about 1970, the habits of 1970 America and 2020, because people say, well, why did people gain weight? And people always come back to, well, it's, you know, uh, calories in, calories out. It's what you eat compared to how much you exercise. So just eat less and exercise more, which is the sort of standard advice that people have been given. But it doesn't explain why is it that obesity went from sort of very low rates to very, very high rates we have today. Like, did all of America all of a sudden just want to eat more and move less? Like, that that doesn't even make sense. Like, nobody told us, oh, you should, like eat more food, right? Like, there was no... I remember no seeing the PSAs on that. that. <laughs> eat more. Yeah. Only you can Move save less. forest fires in America. <laughs> yeah, more video games and TV. It's good for you, right? Nobody said that, right? It was never part of uh, a, a, a conscious thing. So what is it that changed? And of course, the thing that changed was the foods that we ate in 1977, for example, was the big turning point. You can see that obesity rates are sort of very slowly moving up uh, from, say, 1900 to 1970. Then in 1977, they take this big, sharp turn up like that. And that's exactly the point where uh, the uh, government decided to tell us that we should be eating more bread. That's the, that's basically what they said. So it was this whole low fat thing. Fat is bad for you. Fat causes heart disease. And uh, that was the whole food pyramid, right? Yeah. In the 1980s, we had this huge low fat craze, right? The pyramid. And if you look at the original pyramid, there's pictures of like bread and potatoes and rice. And this is the stuff you're supposed to eat seven to eight of these things. So seven slices of white bread a day. Well, Holy does crap. anybody really think that's really slimming? It's like, that's this not even fun slimming, to me. right? And these are actually the foods that if you go back to the fifties, your grandmother would say, those are the fattening foods. These starchy foods uh, tend to make people gain weight, right? So we're eating the foods that we had always known, to be sort of fattening, right? Mm -hmm. Starchy potatoes, white potatoes, white bread, white rice. And yet we were being told then to eat more and more of these foods. And hey, well, what happened? Well, Americans started to gain weight. So that's the point. It's not that people all of a sudden lost their willpower in 1977, right? That doesn't even make sense. Um, it was this complete change in the way that we thought about food and the types of food that we ate all of a sudden change because, uh, and, and only one, you know, person, only one body can do that. And it's the government, of course, because everybody trusts what the government does. Then of course they go into the schools, they teach all the kids to eat low fat. They put all the, 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 the things out saying eat low fat. Right. And then all of a sudden that's how you change the behavior of a population. So there's an official government policy. And that's the reason that people started to gain all that weight. So it was, the whole thing was sort of this, really bad confluence of events. And then you say, well, what was it about the low fat? And this is very interesting too, because the whole low fat thing was a total sham as well. So what happened was that in the 50s and 60s, Americans were getting more heart attacks than ever before. So you'd have these, you know, 60 year old business people and they'd get a heart attack out of the blue. And nobody really knew the reason for that. And when you look back, the reason is fairly obvious. Uh, people were smoking a lot. So, you know, they went to World War I, World War II, they came back, and basically everybody was smoking. So remember, doctors smoke more camels and stuff. So uh, even the doctors they smoke smoking. in the hospital. Yeah, they're smoking everywhere. <laughs> remember, they had these little ashtray things in your car. <laughs> They're like, they're like, I'm not sure why you have lung cancer, a patient, um, but uh, all of our stalkers are <laughs> trying to figure out why you have lung cancer. It's crazy. Yeah, and then uh, if you ever, I don't know if you remember, but on the airplanes, they also had these little ashtray things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still see them on airplanes. So for a while, the old planes had them. <laughs> Like yeah, and it's like, okay, well, smoking with all this oxygen and uh, pressurized cap, <laughs> that's a bad idea. Yeah. So, I remember watching Dirty, if you watch Dirt, the movie but Dirty. Anyway, Good. Um, so, uh, Good. So, anyway, so, so everybody was smoking, and that's why we were getting all these heart attacks. But nobody knew at the time, right? Because remember, the tobacco company spent 
millions and millions of dollars telling us that smoking was safe and all that. That took a long time. And initially it was for lung cancer, but then eventually it turns out it's, hey, it's really bad for heart attacks too. And that's probably the reason everybody's having heart attacks because it, it was just reflecting all the smoke. So, but, but at the time nobody knew it. So then they said, well, you know, well, we don't know why. So, so they uh, were looking for a reason why Americans had this epidemic of heart disease. And they landed on the idea that it was too much fat, especially saturated fat. So, you know, rates of heart attacks were two, three, four times what they were in 1900. But if you look at the diet of the Americans, it was actually the exact same in 1900 and 1950. Yeah. It was like the same thing. They weren't eating more meat. They weren't eating more fat. They were eating exactly the same. Yet heart attack rates went up. So it's like, well, if you're blaming the, the fat, on the, the animal fat, the butter and so on, why would it all of a sudden jump when you haven't been eating more butter? People were eating the same amount of butter. So it didn't even make sense at all. And the other thing is that, hey, people have been eating animal fats and saturated fats like coconut fat and, you know, butter for thousands of years. So why would it be fine for 5,000 years of human history? And then, hey, since 1950, it causes heart disease. So that didn't make sense either, right? Because these are not foods that were new into our system. So the whole, the whole thing was a bit controversial, to say the least. But the problem was that there's a group of very influential doctors who thought that fat was really the worst thing ever. So they sort of went before the government and the government says, yes, you guys are right. So it wasn't like a scientific debate. It was just some politician who said, hey, the low fat people are right everybody should be eating a little fat. So it's it like a giant experiment in mm -hmm. national policy because nobody mm -hmm. prior to 1977 had ever told you what to eat. Your mother told you what to eat. That was it, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. anybody else's business what you ate. Now from 1977, it was all low fat, low fat, low fat. So what happened was that they changed from butter and saturated fat was the thing they blamed. So we changed from butter, remember, to <laughs> margarine which was a total sham as well, because it turns out that the margarine was full of trans fats, which actually cause heart disease. So the food that didn't cause heart disease, butter, was we, we, we got rid of it so that we could eat more margarine, which actually did cause heart disease. So in trying to avoid the heart disease, we actually gave ourselves more heart disease. And some estimates uh, suggest that uh, about 100,000 heart attacks per year were because of the margarine. So it's like that's the absolutely oil. tragic that we were so stupid to turn away from a natural food like butter to that. But anyway, that was the low-fat mania of the 1980s and 1990s. So, of course, if you remember at the time, there's all this low-fat this, low-fat that. And everybody thought avocados were like liquid death, right? It was like, oh, that was terrible for you. And those stupid Italians with their olive oil, they're going to kill themselves eating all that olive oil, right? And that was really the prevalence of the time. And I don't know if you remember at the time, people talked about the French paradox was that, hey, these French people are eating heavy cream, they're eating butter, they're eating like foie gras, which is this fatty duck liver, and they're having like a third of the heart attacks of Americans. So how can they eat so much fat and not have heart attacks? And they called this the French paradox, which wasn't a paradox because the natural fats weren't causing heart disease. It was really just as simple as that. Um, but of course we didn't know it. So that's when, um, and then the, you know, by the two thousands, people started, uh, seeing that, Hey, Mediterranean diet is really healthy for you. Hey, avocados, olive oil, all those things are great for you. And then they started noticing that nuts, another very high fat food, very heart protective walnuts, for example. And then they started noticing fatty fish, like salmon and stuff. People who ate a lot of fatty fish were doing way better having way less heart attacks. So the whole thing started to fall apart. So you've got these healthy fats. Now a lot of these natural fats like butter are sort of back in. And so the whole thing took a big U-turn from, we went from hysterical fat, you know, phobia to everybody kind of started coming around. But the upshot of that was that the low fat movement, of course, spawned this huge high carb um, movement right so when yeah, you you look at the foods foods it's it's either protein fat or carbohydrates 
protein is very hard to raise or lower in your diet because unless you're eating just lean beef and white egg whites all day long, protein, if you get too low fat protein, like high protein, low fat, it's just inedible, right? It's just like, uh, there's, there's not, it's dry. It's, it's hard to eat. It's like, uh, you know, really, really lean meat. It's just hard to eat. There's no flavor there. So the, the, the thing is that if protein stays the same, if you want to lower the, the calories of fat, you wind up raising the calories of carbohydrates. And we weren't eating beans and broccoli. We were eating white bread. So everybody started eating all kinds of high carb foods, you know, bread and rice and all this big plates of pasta. And then of course, um, the problem is that those high carbohydrate foods were not really great for us. Uh, the other thing is that these really refined foods, they really just don't uh, keep you full. So if you're eating breakfast and you're eating say steak and eggs, you stay full for a long time because of the protein, because of the fat. If you eat just sort of white, white bread and jam, well, there's nothing to keep you full, right? And we know that because when you eat fat and when you eat protein, you release hormones that tell you to stop eating. These are satiety hormones. So you eat uh, white bread, which is you know highly refined um, carbohydrate. None of these sort of satiety hormones get released. So then you eat it, and then by you know by 10:30 in the morning, all of a sudden you're ravenously hungry, scrounging around for a low-fat muffin. Then 12 o'clock, eat a big plate of pasta, you know, low fat. By 2:30, you're super hungry again, looking for a bagel or a cookie or something. So now all of a sudden, instead of eating three meals a day, you've gone to eating like six or seven meals a day. And then people thought it was a good idea. But the problem is, of course, if you're eating all the time, that's going to make you gain weight. But people thought it was the right thing to do because they're eating low fat. And, you know, so this whole thing, so the two big changes were in the foods that we ate, like what we ate, which is much more refined carbohydrates than ever before. And when we ate, which was we're eating six or seven times a day instead of three times a day. Because again, if you remember in the 70s, it was breakfast, lunch, dinner, no snacks. You wanted a bedtime snack. No way you should eat more at dinner. You wanted an after school snack. No way you're going to ruin your dinner, right? It, it was, there was no snacking. It just didn't exist because you should have been eating more at dinner. Now it was impossible to eat enough to stay full for the whole time. So people started snacking all the time. And so the two big things, which is what you eat and when you eat, they both sort of conspired to make us much more likely to gain weight. That is, if you're eating foods that are fattening and you're eating them all the time, well, hello, that's just, you know, an invitation to gain weight. So it wasn't that Americans today are, have less willpower than Americans 50 years from now, or Americans today have less willpower than the Japanese person, right? That, that, that's not the case. It's that the foods that we ate, what we're told of what to eat was exactly the foods that we needed to gain weight. So let's break that down. So fat is fairly good for us. Proteins are good for us. Um, the uh, I would say, I guess, natural fats and natural proteins, right? Because we have all the synth synth yeah. synthesized stuff, you know, especially like corn and and different things that's just and sugar that's been screwed with. I mean, I, I used to I see all these people who are like, I'm drinking diet soda that has that has mice poison in it because it's it's better. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know about that. Yeah, the problem with a lot of these things is that processed foods, whether it's processed carbs or processed meats or processed um, fats, um, our body doesn't know how to handle them. So it's, if you look at foods that are very close to their natural form, so coconut or meat, you know, that's the way it comes out, or even a carbohydrate such as beans, right? This is the way they come, right? There's a bean, you dry it, and then you, that, that's it. Um, so our bodies have sort of evolved for thousands of years and we, we can handle it. We know how to handle it. So we evolve hormones to tell us how much we should eat and when we've eaten enough and that kind of thing. Um, when you start processing foods, you get rid of a lot of those natural satiety signals. Uh, so it doesn't, it, it, you know, you wind up being, being very prone to overeating them. So if you think about overeating, um, suppose, you know, you go to a buffet and you eat like too much food, right? So you eat, you eat, you eat, you're really, really full. If somebody just 
drops like a pork chop in front of you and say, hey, have another one. You'd be like, oh man, I'm going to throw up, right? You, you can't eat anymore. Physically, you can't eat anymore because that pork or whatever has a lot of satiety signals. So you eat pork, your body's going to feel full. So you're going to say, oh no, I can't do that. I'm going to throw up, right? And that's why they have these you know, those restaurants that give you, oh, you eat a 60 ounce steak in an hour, we'll give it to you free. They're not going out of business. They're not giving away a lot of free steak. It's really, really hard to do that. But if you have that buffet and you're feeling really full and somebody says, here, have a chocolate chip cookie. You're like, yeah, I can do that. Why? Because there's no satiety thing. Or here, so here's some sugary soda, have some sugary soda. You're like, yeah, I can do that. Now there's a lot of calories in that sugary soda. But the point is that there's no, nothing in that soda, nothing in that cookie is going to make you feel full. So therefore you can keep putting it in, which makes it much more prone to overeating. So the, the point is that when you eat natural foods, you almost always won't go wrong because your body will handle it. When you eat processed foods, whether it's processed carbs or fat or whatever, then you're going to be in danger of not having the proper signal. That is just like an apple, for example. It's very hard to eat seven or eight apples in one sitting. But if you drink a glass of apple juice, hey, no problem, right? And, and that's the same thing because the apple juice has everything taken out of it except for the sugar and the water sort of thing. And when you drink something that has a high amount of sugar, does that, that's going to cause your insulin to spike too as well, right? Yeah, and system? so it all comes down to the insulin. And insulin is what you need to keep your eye on. That's the most important hormone for how the body gains fat. Because the thing is that when you eat, um, and you're, I'm assuming you eat sort of a variety of foods. I've eaten a insulin. couple things, as you can tell, looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that insulin goes up. And the job of insulin is to tell you to store that food, right? And you store it as body fat, okay? So it's, that's its job. It's not a bad thing. So, but if you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're going to take more food in at dinner time, for example, than you can use immediately. So insulin goes up, you store some of it, right? When you go to sleep, your insulin is going to fall. And then that's going to draw some of that energy back out so that you have energy. This is for your liver and your kidneys and your heart. And, you know, your, all those organs need, need fuel. So, but, and you're not eating at the time. So you've stored some away. You're going to draw some out. And the signal to do that is when your insulin level starts to fall. You're going to start pulling some of that energy back out. So if you keep those um, two things in balance, that is when you're feeding, you're storing energy. When you're fasting, you're using energy. Okay, so you need to keep those in balance. So you think about 1970, you ate breakfast at six, uh, you know, eight o'clock uh, in the morning, and you ate dinner at six o'clock. Because remember, the women were at home and cooking dinner. So when, the, when you got home, you ate relatively early dinner at six o'clock. So eight to six, you're eating. So 10 hours of the day. And from then on, 14 hours is fasting. So if you keep the feeding and the fasting in balance, it means that on one hand, the amount of time you're storing energy and the amount of time you're using energy are relatively balanced. Now, of course, people are eating all the time. So you eat the minute you get up. And if you don't, somebody says, oh, the breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right? And then it's like, and then you eat, eat, eat until you go to bed. So the most recent studies show that the average duration of eating is about 14 hours and 45 minutes per day. So that means if you started eating at 8 a.m., you wouldn't stop until 1045 on average. That's the average person. So there's no mm. point in there that they've stopped eating. So now instead of 14 hours of fasting, you're talking about, say, eight hours of fasting. And now you've tipped the balance because you're spending way more time storing energy than you are using energy, right? And yeah. that's the big thing. It's just like if you go... You know, you fill up your car. So you fill up your car, you drive it around, right? Now, all of a sudden, if you just spend more time filling up your car and less time driving it around, you're going to have too much gas. That's the same thing. We have too much energy, which gets stored as fat. So the way you balance that is you increase the number of uh, hours of fasting. Or remember, insulin is that, that hormone that tells our body to store fat. You can change the foods that you eat because different foods will stimulate insulin to different um, levels. So people say, oh, calories are the same, calories are the same. Calories are totally different. So the, the, you know, if you eat cookies, your insulin is going to spike way up. 
If you drink soda, your insulin is going to spike. If you eat an egg, it's not going to spike. So what, what it means is that, you know, even though they're the same number of calories, the effect on storing fat, like the instruction, you know, insulin is that instruction to our body to store fat. And you're giving different amounts of that instruction depending on the food that you eat. You eat cookies, you're telling your body, hey, you need to store fat. You eat an egg, you're telling your body, you don't need to store fat, it's okay, just, just use it. So therefore, what it means practically, and so many people say this, it's so stupid, a calorie is a calorie. It's like, that's not the question I'm asking, right? Did I ever ask you, hey, is a calorie a calorie? It's like, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. <laughs> The question, word is a word. Yeah, that's right. It's right. like, is a dog a dog? It's like, yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, but so it's like, that's you're answering a question that was never asked. Except that when question, it's not a dog. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know what that means. The question really is, are all calories equally fattening? And to that, it's a no. Like, people don't get fat eating broccoli. That's just the way it is, right? You can eat as much broccoli as you wanted. You will not get fat. That's just life, right? And that's something that, you know, your grandmother knew. She wasn't so stupid as to think that all calories are exactly the same fattening ability. Some calories are fattening and some calories are not fattening. And it all is to do with the hormonal instructions. When you eat um, broccoli and when you eat a cookie, the moment you put it in your mouth, the hormonal response of our body is completely different. So there's nothing equal about them. So calories have different fattening abilities. And that's the real answer. So these people who say a calorie is a calorie, it's like these people just haven't thought very hard about the problem. They're very, very simplistic in their thinking, thinking that all foods can be reduced like to their calorie sort of level. And that's sort of like saying, well, you know, we're going to reduce all people to, uh, you know, their weight or something like that, right? So therefore, somebody who weighs 100 pounds, well, you know, you need two of those 100 pound people to do the work of one 200 pound person. And because all, you know, pounds are the same, right? It's like, uh, no, because you have two people who are working and how much they work is, has nothing to do with uh, how much they weigh, right? But you're trying to reduce everything to a single measure like calories, when it actually has nothing to do with it because calories doesn't tell your body whether to store fat or not. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's just, so, so, so therefore by understanding that you can see why something like a low carbohydrate diet could be effective. And you can see why fasting could be a very effective way because it's going to do two things. It's going to lower the insulin because you're dropping your insulin and two, you're giving it the time that it needs in order for your body to use that, that, that energy. You're saying go over there and eat that fat off your body as opposed to putting it in your mouth, maybe? Exactly. And this is the thing that always strikes me also as uh, is funny is because if you think about body fat, body fat is a store of calories. It's a store of the food energy that you took yesterday and the day before and the day before that. That's what your body fat is. Literally, the reason you have it is so that you will survive if you do not eat tomorrow, right? That's the whole purpose of body fat. So you're actually, when you fast for, say, 24 hours, 36 hours, you are simply using the body fat for precisely the reason you are carrying it. So then what's wrong with that, right? People all say, oh, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. It's like, what's bad about it? That's the only reason because it's not there. Your body fat is not there for looks. It's there for you to use as a store of calories, right? And then on my Tinder profile, I may be fat, <laughs> but I, I just have a lot of storage. <laughs> you know, I, I can speak to what you uh, talked about. Um, I had kind of an epiphany on our last conversation that we had on the show. Uh, a, a few years ago, I had hit about, uh, I think it was 370. And I was just feeling awful and just at the bottom. And, and I, I said, fuck it. And I quit drinking. I was drinking probably 10 Mountain Dews a day. I mean, I would wake up and drink Mountain Dew. I switched to Mountain, from Mountain Dew to coffee. But, you know, I wasn't drinking 10 coffees a day. But, I, you know, just for clarification, I was drinking a lot of pop, sometimes more than 10. 
Um, and I was eating, you know, I was eating out, I was eating Stouffer's, you know, but frozen dinners, which, you know, you want to talk about processed food. And I switched to being a vegan and I just would eat natural foods. Like I would go to the grocery store, I'd buy whatever was in the produce section and I'd leave. And, um, and I started losing three to four pounds a day. Like people were just going insane with it. I would post every day on Facebook, like, here's my proof. Um, and I lost over three months, close to a hundred pounds. Wow. Um, and I had thought that a lot of it was because I went vegan, you know, I started eating natural foods, but the, the thing that clicked in my head as an epiphany when I was talking to you was one of the, one of the strategies I enabled was I would drink coffee in the morning instead of my usual one or two Mountain Dews. And I would wait as long as I could, usually till about lunchtime before I'd have my first meal. And then it would be a small meal. And then dinner would kind of be a little bit bigger, like a little bit more normal mealish, but not a lot. And that was it. And then anytime I felt, you know, like I needed something, I drink coffee. And I didn't realize it at the time until I talked to you that really, I don't think it really was so much the veganism. It was really that intermittent fasting where I, I wasn't eating in the morning and I would just power through. And I actually, after I got off with you on the podcast, I think about a month ago, uh, I actually started doing that again. Not quite as good as I should be. Let's put it that way. But now I'm drinking coffee in the morning, which I usually do. And I'm trying to go as far as I can before I make that first meal. And I've noticed a significant difference in my body and yeah. how I feel and everything. I need to and do better with it. Yeah. So. And I think that the thing is that uh, when you start doing it, you start to notice that a lot of the stuff that people tell you about fasting actually just was not true so people you know the main concern i'll tell you the number one concern there's two big concerns with fasting and I, I is one the hunger right so people always think okay well you know it's fine i can fast but i'm going to be so hungry and when they start to do it on a consistent basis because there's about two weeks in there people do get quite hungry um the actual hunger the physical hunger actually starts to go away which is really, really interesting. So if you look at the study, uh, we measure something, a hormone called ghrelin, which is called the hunger hormone. And the hunger hormone, the, high, the higher it is, the hungrier you feel. So um, what's interesting during fasting is when they look at people over 24 hours, uh, they see that ghrelin spikes in a regular, in an average person three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So people who are used to eating three times a day, they get hungry three times a day. But the the interesting thing is that if you simply don't eat, so say you skip your lunch, mm -hmm. um, what happens to ghrelin? Well, it turns out that it will stay high for a little bit and then it'll just drop. And by, so at one o'clock, you're hungry. If you don't eat lunch, by four o'clock, your ghrelin is actually at baseline, which means that your level of hunger is actually the same as if you ate lunch. And same thing for dinner. So it spikes up if you don't eat. If you simply ignore it for an hour, or hour and a half, by nine o'clock, that hunger dissipates. And in fact, we've all had this, of course, where you start doing something. For me, it's like when I get really busy, usually with some project like home renovation or something, like you're painting the house or something like that, right? And I, I always thought about this because every time I start doing it, I get so into it, I wind up not eating, but not even being hungry. Like the hunger just dissipates. It just goes away because when you don't eat, what happens is that your body gets the calories it needs from your body fat. So what you've done in essence is you've fed your body with your body fat and therefore your hunger just goes down. When you start talking about doing multiple day fasts, like two, three, four days, what you see is that the ghrelin peaks at around day two. And then by day four, day five, the hunger actually goes, just goes away. So by day five, people are, are doing their regular, everything they normally do. And they're like, well, I'm not hungry at all. So if you're not hungry and you're using up your stores of body fat and losing weight, it's like, hey, now you're working with your body to lose weight because the hunger has actually gone down. So people always come back and they say, you know what? I thought I'd be hungry, but what happened? I think my stomach shrank. I can't eat that much anymore. And it's like, that's perfect. Because what's happening is that you're getting your body used to eating your body fat. 
So therefore, you're not as hungry. You don't need to take so much excess food, like exogenous food, because you're, you're using up your stores of food, right? So your body is still using it. And that's the other thing that people worry about. People say, oh, your metabolic rate's going to go down. You're going to go into starvation mode. It's like, it actually doesn't happen. Because again, your body doesn't go. So what people are talking about when they say their metabolic rate goes down or they're going into starvation mode is that the number of calories that they burn every day is going to go down. So this happens when you diet. When you do that 500 calories a day decrease, your body actually starts to burn 500 calories a day less. And that's why your weight plateaus. It's not that you're bad on your diet. It's that the body, you know, your body just is burning less. The problem when you're burning less is that you feel bad. You feel cold, you feel tired, you feel hungry, that kind of thing. That doesn't happen as much during fasting because what your body has done is it hasn't shut down its metabolism. It simply switched its fuel source. So instead of using food, it's using your body fat. Then your body's like, hey, look, I have a ton of this, this, this energy here. So why do I need to use less? right? I have a couple hundred thousand calories of body fat. Let me just use it. I'm not going to reduce what I'm taking. So body, you know, so your hunger goes down, your metabolic rate stays up. And then the other thing people worry about is that they can't concentrate and stuff and they, or they have no energy. And again, that's a total myth. It actually doesn't happen because during fasting, what people have, uh, what we've known for many, many years is that when your insulin goes down, other hormones go up. And these hormones include the sympathetic nervous system and noradrenaline. So you're actually pumping up. You're actually increasing your metabolic rate. You're increasing your energy. So that's why people can concentrate better when they're, they haven't eaten. So you think about Thanksgiving, you eat a big meal. You're not really sharp, right? You just want to sit down and watch some football. When you're hungry, that's when your, your concentration powers are at its highest because your focus, your body has pumped up those hormones, the adrenaline, the sympathetic nervous system. It's actually revving itself up when you're fasting, not shutting itself down. Because you think, okay, if you're in the wild, do you really want to face the hungry wolf? Or do you want to face that lion who just ate? It's like that hungry wolf is much more dangerous it's much more tuned in, it's concentrating, and it's got the energy to come and kill you, as opposed to the lion who just ate, who just says, ah, go, go away, right? So it's really interesting because the metabolic changes that happen with the fasting are so beneficial, um, and they're exactly what you want if you want to lose weight, compared to saying cutting 500 calories a day, which is almost guaranteed to fail. And this is one of the reasons people can't lose weight is because the advice that they take, which is cut 500 calories a day. And so that's one advice that's just very, very bad because when you just cut 500 calories a day and you eat low fat foods, what happens is that you never allow the changes. You never allow the time for the body to switch over into utilizing its own body fat. And the other advice that turns out to be really, really bad is that people say, well, it's all about calories. You know, just cut your calories. You could have ice cream for dinner if you want. It's like, no, you can't. That's really dumb advice. Um, so you have to change the foods that you eat into those foods. And all natural foods are pretty good for you. But you can't just eat like processed foods, even like these bars and stuff. They're all very highly processed and artificial and they're probably not good for you. And then they tell people, don't fast, right? It's like, must eat breakfast, might eat snacks, eat six times a day. Well, how is eating six times a day going to make you lose weight? Like, tell me that, right? Because <laughs> if I eat zero times a day and you eat six times a day, I'm pretty sure that I am going to lose more weight than you. Like, it's not that difficult to understand. So if you have a strategy which is like fasting. So you've got all these benefits, right? So many benefits. So it's free. So anybody can do it. It's available. That is, you can do it tomorrow. You don't need special equipment. You don't need special permission. You don't need anything. It's convenient. You can do it anytime, anywhere. It's flexible. You can do it today and not tomorrow. Or if tomorrow is a bad day for it, you do it another time, right? Totally flexible. Um, and it's been done for thousands of years. That is, if you look at every major religion, whether it's, you know, Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism, they all have periods of fasting, right? So you know that humans have been fasting literally for thousands of years. If there was something wrong with it, we would know. 
Why? Mm -hmm. Because say you take a, a religion like um, Buddhism, where they fast fairly regularly, or the Greek Orthodox Church, where they fast regularly. If it was really bad for them, you wouldn't have any more Buddhists. They would have <laughs> died, right? You know, it's like, it's that simple. But there are a lot of Buddhists and there are a lot of Christians, right? So during Lent, for example, all that my priest talks about is fasting for weeks and weeks. Uh, it's just all about fasting. And it's like, okay, so Christians fast during Lent and Good Friday and all these other things. So if fasting was so harmful to us, there would be no Christians in the world today. We'd all be dead, right? It just doesn't work that way. So you, you have, you know, the, the, the time has told you that this is safe because people have done it before and you can do it and there's no problem with doing it. And, you know, you're saving money because you're not eating, you're not doing anything fancy like that. It's just a great way to get better. Is it fun? No, it's not fun. That's the problem. Right? And that's why we Sweet we stuff is fun. fun. <laughs> Come on, Dr. Fung, you're, you're taking away all my fun. <laughs> you know that's, it's interesting uh, that's why we did the fasting method.com that's that's uh, our website we try to put people in a community where they'll get the help they need get their questions answered like oh what do i do if i get headaches what do i do if i get constipated what do i do if, you know there are things that that do come up with fasting and um that you know the book goes over that but uh, community having people who encourage you and the tools that you need you know to track all of those things Mm -hmm. uh, we try to do on the fasting method.com. You know, it's kind of interesting. You were talking about how, you know, switching a power source. I was thinking of a, like an analogy you could use of, of a hybrid car yeah. where you have two different power sources. You have either gas or you yeah. have the electronics. And so you just think about from that thing. And that was one of the things I overcame when I was going through my weight loss was I would go to bed and I'd be like, I should have a Mountain Dew before I go to bed, or I should eat a cookie before I go to bed. Cause I don't want to, you know, wake up hungry. <laughs> and so you know i i do that but but when i lost on my weight i had cut that out i would eat and then when it was time for bed i'd be like going to bed and sometimes my body would be playing that game with me and be like we're hungry and i'm like you'll live you'll live till tomorrow i have a yeah. good feeling well um, actually the the interesting thing about hunger is that everybody thinks it's a function of having no food in your stomach for a long time that's actually completely false it's it's all a hormonal uh, signal. So if you think about uh, the circadian rhythm, that is, you take a lot of people, see how hungry they are through times of the day. What you'll find is that the time of the day that people on average are the least hungry. What, 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 what do you think? What time of the day do you think people are least hungry? Before bedtime? I don't know. No, the least hunger Boring. is 8 a.m. So most yeah. people uh, on average are the least hungry at 8 a.m. And the highest level of hunger on average is 8 p.m. So mm -hmm. that's interesting because 8 a.m. is the time of the day where you've gone the longest without food. You've mm -hmm. gone like 12 hours without food because you went to bed and you're actually the least hungry. And it's because of the hormones in our system. So what's interesting about that is that you can sort of hack that. So if you can go through the night with the fasting. So, you know, just like you're saying with the Mountain Dew or a cookie before bed, if you can get rid of that cookie before bed or the Mountain Dew before bed, what happens is, of course, that you go to sleep. So you get all this time that you're just burning fat. And then because of the hormonal changes that happen when you wake up, everything's reset. The next day, your level of hunger is the same, no matter whether you ate three meals the day before or no meals the day before. And it's very interesting because, you know, from having done some longer fasts, like three-day fast, five-day fast, what's really interesting is that the hunger actually totally resets by, by the second day. You totally forget that you didn't eat anything the day before. It just so sort of slowly goes down. And as you get into day four, day five, the hunger is actually completely like, you just don't notice that at all, but you feel a lot lighter. You feel a lot more energetic and it's really a very freeing uh, sort of thing. And, and the reason I say that is because it, it gives you this really powerful tool because where people feel helpless is when they try to lose weight and they can't do it. So, you know, you have these very successful people and um, that what we can do is, you know, we 
uh, you know, you're very successful and you've done all this important stuff and then they can't lose weight. It's like, well, how does that work? Why is it that these people are so successful, they can drive themselves so hard, have willpower, have, you know, all this stuff and they can't lose weight? Well, it's because the information that they're given was just very bad. So give them the right information. And, it, you know, it's, it's uh, and, and you can see how they're going to improve in terms of the weight. And one of the simple ways to do that is, uh, sort of fasting because it's been in our DNA for so many uh, years. It's been uh, part of the part of the human sort of uh, history. You know whether you're talking about the religions or whether you're talking about people who did cleanses and all that sort of stuff. So it gives you a tool. So it's very freeing because it's it gives you something to keep in your back pocket. I do this all the time. So for uh, like I go, uh, you know, obviously I haven't been away anywhere for a long time because of COVID, but um, you know, in the, in the summer I used to take a vacation and sometimes I'd go on a cruise or whatever and I eat all kinds of stuff, like not good stuff. Right. It's like, you know, pizza in the middle of the day. It's like, Oh, free pizza and ice cream. And it's like not good stuff. It was, but you know, I had made that decision that I'm on vacation and I'm going to enjoy it if I want it. If I don't want, it, I won't. Right. But, and, and I'd always gain about five pounds or something like that, right? It was quite a bit for one week. Um, but then what I always did was do a long fast afterwards. So I'd do it. I'd do maybe three days plus a couple of 24 hours. And then within a week, I'd be back to my normal weight. It's like, okay, so I got to enjoy all of that stuff, all of that stuff that wasn't good for me. And within a week, I'm back to where I was. Well, that's very freeing. That's incredible knowledge that I have something that I can use to keep myself from steadily gaining weight, right? So it's giving people power back over their body using this sort of simple, free, available tool that nobody can take away from you. It's not even free. Like it saves you money, right? It's you're practically being paid to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, 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 it's incredibly powerful. And, and what's important is to get the information, but also get the, so it's the education, get the tools, get the knowledge that you need, whether it's from books or from, from website or whatever, um, get those things and you can implement it right now. Right. It's, there's nothing stopping you. So uh, in your book, there's a chapter on cortisol and the Atkins onslaught. Uh, do you want to expand a little bit on what that's about? Yeah, so the Atkins uh, diet was a low-carb diet and initially was a very high-fat diet. So when you, Robert Atkins, when he did it, he didn't make up the diet, actually. Uh, it was quite interesting because in the 1960s, Robert Atkins, who was a cardiologist, was actually gaining a bit of weight himself. So then he said, well, let me see what the top doctors are doing to lose weight. And they were eating a low carbohydrate, sort of a relatively high fat, right? So they would cut down the, the carbohydrates and that's what he did. And it wasn't um, particularly uh, uh, controversial at the time. It was in all the leading, uh, it was standard practice in medical. It was written up in these uh, New England Journal, which is the best medical practice, uh, medical um, you know, journal of, of its day and still today. So he did, he, he basically followed that, lost a lot of weight. So then he started his clinic and he was using that. And then the whole low fat thing came along. So his thing became sort of contra a little bit controversial because of the high fat. So um, it, it sort of got rebooted. And so the whole low fat thing took, took Atkins way down because instead of eating low carb, everybody was told to eat high carb, right? Lots of bread, lots of pasta. So that thing got taken down uh, basically and through the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was sort of this quackery sort of thing, right? But it was always actually not quackery. It was based on good science. And then it sort of got relaunched in the 90s as a sort of a high protein sort of thing. So, you know, they're like, okay, you can be low carb and low fat too because there's snack wells. So you can, you can eat all these fake foods. And it sort of became redone as a high protein um, sort of a diet. And that led to a bit of a boom in the 2000s, but that sort of yeah. faded um, because the high protein turns out to be not so easy to do and not necessarily good for you. So that 
kind of uh, got recast because protein can affect the insulin as well. So then that's what led to the whole more recent movement where people are sort of low carb and high fat, not just sort of normal fat, but not high protein. Protein sort of normal, but high fat. So lots of natural fats. And that's the sort of ketogenic diet that, that, that has recently become very popular um, because again, it can cause some good weight loss. People always worry that it's going to cause heart disease. But again, um, the key is to focus on natural fats uh, that our bodies ha- are able to process. So that's sort of the, 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 the reasoning behind that. And it was the sort of story of the Atkins, which sort of started out sort of a high fat diet, did well for a bit, got sort of sidelined by the low fat movement and then got, got sort of reborn uh, as, a, as a high protein diet, which became a bit of its undoing because, and then sort of gave way to this uh, more recent sort of low carb uh, ketogenic uh, movement, which, you know, has its proponents and has its detractors, but, you know, on average is it's, it's a reasonable sort of a diet. I would meet these people and they're like, I'm eating steak 24 seven. And then you're like, I don't know, man, about that. I'm on the Atkins diet. You're like, you're like, I don't know that eating porterhouses three times a day is like the <laughs> thing you should be doing. Uh, in yeah. your book, uh, it has uh, in the appendix it has some sample meal plans, it has a practical guide to fasting, meditation, and I guess your other book, a complete guide to fasting. This kind of goes more into depth along the lines of what's on your website. I like it because it's got pictures and it's big, big pages, easy to read for <laughs> stupid people like me. But it, you can look at the graphs and you can understand what's going on and, and what's being talked about. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's the, the idea is, uh, you know, and people say, oh, how come there's recipes? And it's like, well, it's because you want to eat sort of the right foods when you're not fasting as well. Um, you know, so other than fixing the sort of fasting period, you want to make sure that you eat foods. And, and the thing is that when you eat foods that are like very high in refined carbohydrates, they make the fasting a lot harder. So if you're eating bread and jam, for example, then you get these big spikes in insulin, which wind up making you hungry. So if you're eating foods that are going to keep you full for longer, like, you know, natural fats and protein, then it's going to make it easier to sort of move into fasting because you're going to be able to go longer without getting hungry. So, but you can do it from both. It's not a, it's not a problem, but there are some recommendations. And and you also talk in the obesity code about uh, obesity uh, child or childhood issues, obesity, uh, people who grow up poor, obesity. You know, I, I one thing I did address when I was losing all that weight was some of the mental things that I had where, you know, like one rule that, that you know, was given to me, my parents, a lot of people did, you know, your, your mom said, eat everything on your plate. And so I learned that to try and listen for the signals of when I was done eating, you don't have to eat everything in your plate. Uh, you don't have to eat before you go to bed. Uh, what was the other signal that I, I started paying attention to that was really important, but, but, oh, it was, it was the reward signal. I used to have this thing where it's like, if you go to the store and you, you don't buy a fatty foods, you get a reward of a candy bar or you get yeah. a reward of a Mountain Dew. And I, I couldn't believe when I started really listening to how much I played that tape in my head, how much I played that tape in my head. And yeah. that was contributing to a lot of my fat and stuff. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. Um, and I think that's a, that wound up being a huge problem in this pandemic is that, hey, there's nothing to do. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to have some ice cream. And I'll tell you that I was just as guilty as the next guy. It's, it, was a, it was tough. Like, uh, you know, because honestly, when you take away everything fun except eating, yeah. people are going to eat. Right. And you're worrying. Uh, no more hanging out with friends. I wasn't watching the game. You know, it's mm. like, okay, well, what is there to do? Hey, there's some ice cream. Let's go have some ice cream. Right. And it's tough because there's a lot of these non food things that you have to think about. Like, mm. and the thing about eating everything on your plate, I mean, for sure, I heard that a lot too when I was growing up. Um, but I, I notice this sometimes when I go to restaurants is that like, you can take it home. Like, you don't have to waste it, like, just put it away and you know take it home eat it the next day so it's 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 quite funny because uh you know i I, it used to strike me as very strange to do that but now it's like 
you know, now I do it all the time and it's like, okay, well, this is, this is just normal for me because you know, of course, if you send it, if you don't eat what's on your plate in a restaurant, that actually is just thrown in the garbage, right? Nobody, yeah. nobody ever eats you, it. You can take it home and so, eat it later. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I'm absolutely going to take this home. So I, I used to feel funny about that whole thing thinking, oh, mm. I should really just eat it. Now I don't feel funny, but I've, I've done it for so many years now. It's like, no, I, I'm just going to pack this up and I'm going yeah. to take this home and, and same at home. Right. So, you know, I remember uh, a while ago, um, you know, sometimes we'd have a dessert this years ago and uh, it wouldn't taste very good. Like we'd buy something and, you know, the cake wasn't fresh or something like that. Right. So it's like, yeah, it tastes terrible. I remember thinking, oh, it's a waste. Like I should eat it. I'm like, now it's like, no, if I'm going to eat dessert, it yeah. better taste good because yeah. otherwise it's better in the garbage than in my stomach right so it's these little things like you really have to think about these things yeah. sometimes because they get uh, these habits they're just sort of automatic sometimes and they're detrimental to your to your you know weight loss efforts and there's no reason to do that that is if you're full already just put your knife down pack yeah. it in, and at home of course it's easier you just pack it in a little container put it in the fridge um, but even if it's just a little bit of stuff, I won't eat it. I'll just put it away or I'll get a box and I'll take it home. And, uh, you know, these little things to really think about and rewards are not always food, right? So you, you get a big promotion, you can do something else. You can go out and get a nice, uh, massage, or you can treat yourself and buy yourself some tickets to the baseball game, or you can go out with some friends and, you know, hiking, or there's other things you can do, but we wind up celebrating all the time with a lot of food and again it's funny at first to do but then after a while it just gets normal like you don't need to do all this stuff so one last question i have for you uh is uh, you know a lot of people i had people saying to me you don't need to be doing this vegan thing and and stuff what you need to be doing is exercising you know and i'm sure exercising you know plays good but i mean what's the if if i have to choose between insulin and exercising uh, in, in fasting, which is better or is both yeah, good? Or... It's not even close. Like exercise is such an inefficient way to lose weight. Like exercise mm. is great for a lot of things. Okay. So it's good for your heart. It's good for your joints. It's good for your muscles. Like no doubt for weight loss, it's almost useless. Like if you ever have gone on a treadmill and looked at that calorie counter or whatever, mm -hmm. it's ridiculously you burn ridiculously few calories running. Like, you know, I went running the other day. It was a half an hour. It was a good run. I mean, uh, and then it's like, oh, how many calories did I burn? And it's a guess, of course, but it's like 120 or something like that. It's like, wow. So if I had a cookie, I would have undone all the calories I burned in the last half hour of relatively strenuous exercise. So it's like, okay, if you're going to exercise three, four hours a day, sure, you'll probably do fine. But if you're doing like regular people, like half an hour, maybe four times a week or something like that, like, you know, an average amount of exercise, the actual amount of calories you burn on that is almost negligible, right? It's, it's the sort of rounding error of your day. So if you're eating 2000 calories in a day, for example, and then you ran, and it's like, okay, well, you ran, it's like uh, an extra 100 calories. I mean, that's like, not even, uh, that's like 5%, right? So if, if you're thinking about it, like diet is sort of like 95% of the game and exercise is like 5%. So don't treat them like 50-50. It's not like Batman mm. and Robin. Like it's like, you know, they're not 50-50 partners, right? <laughs> Batman is the guy. Robin's just some sidekick, <laughs> right? So you know, diet is Batman, <laughs> You know, one of my problems is, is, is I have one of these systems where if I start working out, I start building muscle and I start bulking yeah. and my body goes on this whole, whole craving thing. Like, it's like, you feed me, you know? Yeah. And I'll, I'll go through muscle cramps and different, different things. And like, it will, it will take my hunger meter and, and it's probably just mental, but it, it just sends it right off the chart. Because my body's yeah. like, I need protein. Yeah, and, and that's probably one of the reasons why exercise is just a very inefficient. Because when pe some people, and like, like you're saying, they exercise and then they eat more. So you've yeah. just undone everything that you tried to do to lose weight, right? Because what you really want to do 
is exercise and take the calories it needs from your body fat, right? So, but the problem is in the first beginning until you really train your body to do that, if you're just increasing your hunger for whatever um, afterwards or thinking, oh, I just did a nice workout. I'm going to treat myself to some ice cream. Like you just undid everything. It's, 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 so it's, it's such an inefficient way. Like, you know, the only reason we think of them as equal is – because the sort of uh, Coca-Cola and stuff spent a lot of money trying to make us think that calories are calories. Everything's the same. You know, you're gaining weight because you didn't exercise enough. It's like, no, you gain weight because the foods, it was all about the diet. Like, and I say, you got to focus on where the money is, right? So it's less like in baseball, right? It's like, okay, you can practice hitting and you can practice fielding and all this. And it's like bunting. It's like a 5% part of the game. But you're not going to practice bunting 50% of your time, right? You'd be mm. crazy to do that, right? Because bunting isn't that much. It's not that big a part of the game. So you're not going to practice it all the time as opposed to hitting or something, right? But that's diet and exercise. Why would you focus all your efforts? And it's a lot of effort to, to exercise for a lot of people. Why would you focus all your effort on such a minuscule part of the whole thing? Focus all your effort on the big part, not the little part. And that's the real key to, uh, you know, the, the real key to uh, winning is to focus on what matters, not the stuff that doesn't matter. There you go. Well, I'm glad we clarified that because, you know, people still argue that. And, and like I say, I, and part of, part of it was, is it's really weird. Like I would, like I would start exercising and I'm like, I'm going to eat less. And then you wake up the next morning. You're like, why did my weight go up? Well, it's because you put on muscle, muscles, weight and water weight and you're going the wrong way. I'm like, it used yeah. to, in the old days when I was, didn't understand any of this, it would drive me man, mental. Cause it'd be like, well, I started working out. I've worked out for a whole week and I put on all this muscle, but my, the weight, the scale's going up. Like what the hell? <laughs> so there you yeah. go. Uh, so, uh, check it out guys. Uh, you can go to amazon.com. Uh, the two books we've gotten a chance to talk about today, the obesity code unlocking the secrets of weight loss with Dr. Jason Fung and also the complete guide to fasting. You can go get these uh, at your local bookstore, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you can also see our prior show that we did with this book coming out in November, November 10th. You can order this baby up. It is the cancer code, a revolutionary new understanding of medical mystery and the wellness code. If you Google search it, you can on the Chris Voss show, there's actually a little search box as well. You can search for Dr. Fung. And find the cancer code discussion that we had. It was a good hour and a half of uh, great uh, eye-opening stuff. And you're motivating me to to want to do better. And and uh, since we talked last, I started doing the coffee thing. I started trying to wait as long as I could. And I started really feeling better about my body. Even my digestive system started being like less. I'm, I'm in my 50s now, so my digestive system has a body of its own. And <laughs> so, you know, that, started, that whole system started working a little bit better. In fact, my shirt's sagging, which... I probably need to get some better shirts. So I got to keep doing what you're doing, Dr. Fung. Any plugs or anything uh, you want to say as we go out? No, I mean, I think that uh, you, you cover them well. And, uh, you know, the, the cancer code is uh, coming up. It, it's actually a little bit different from it's not talking so much about fasting and diet, but sort of an understanding of what cancer actually is and how nutrition contributes to it. So it's a really interesting discussion of sort of the modern um, way we think about what the disease actually is. And it's, it's uh, sort of, it's, 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 I think it's just a fascinating sort of uh, topic because it affects so many people, and, um, you know, to know what the enemy sort of actually is. I think you're going to blow up in the world with it. I mean, the discussion we had just blew my mind and everything made sense. The dots connected. And uh, I think your approach to it is pretty amazing and uh, gives people a better thing to do. So look forward to that. November 10th, 2020, you can pre-order it right now in uh, any different format on Amazon or local booksellers next to you. Thanks to Dr. Fung for being on the show again. We certainly appreciate him being here. Uh, be sure to watch the video version of this on youtube.com. Fortress Chris Voss, hit that bell notification button. You can go to our newest syndication, Amazon Music, if you like, or, you know, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Pandora, all that places. Uh, and then uh, what else is there? I think that's about it. The Chris Voss Show dot com or the CBPN. Thanks, Miles, for being here. Oh, Goodreads.com. That's the one thing I'm uh, thinking of. Look me up on Goodreads.com. You can see our reviews and all that good stuff over there. Thanks, Miles, for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time.